Thank you. So why Climate Action Dialogue Series? So as you are aware, um, climate change has continued to pose direct threats to peace, not just at international level, but also at the local level. And each country, if not most of the countries, if not all, continue to experience um, problems or challenges with climate change. It's estimated close to 200 um, countries are at the risk, at, are at the risk of um, you know, not being there in the future because of the climate change. And therefore, we thought just as um, COP27 will be happening next month, we thought as young people from different countries, we can come together and have conversation around climate change, climate action, and the different policies that exist, um, those that have been able to be impact, um, affected, those that are, are still pending. Uh, what are even some of the challenges um, in different countries? What are some of uh, different countries? What kind of challenges are they still experiencing? Um, what are some of the obstacles that we still experience in different countries? Let's say Kenya, uh, Somalia, South Sudan, Pakistan, Venezuela, Colombia, um, South Africa, America, and different other countries. And before even going far with this kind of with conversation, I would like to invite my colleague Hiba from Pakistan to introduce the organizing um, organizations or the organization that have put together this conversation and who they are and where they come from. And then we can go on. Hiba, welcome. Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. Uh, thanks so much for joining our first session. So uh, right now in our organizing teams, we are about uh, like we are from four organizations. We came together and we uh, decided to start these sessions because we felt like it was need of the time. I would like to like briefly tell you how it started and where it started. So all of us were uh, present at the training session just last month. Um, so we were sitting together, we were discussing what is going on in the world nowadays. And we like one common topic that was like a part of our conversations was climate and climate change. So we decided to start this discussion, which is the need of the time, obviously, and we came up with this idea. So uh, I'll start with my, the organization that I'm representing. I'm Hibar Kram. I'm a co-founder of Bidar Society. So Bedar is a youth-led organization and that aims to create awareness and civic sense in the Pakistani people, primar primarily through projects like which are um, like focused around youth and awareness and education programs. So you can know more about our organizations uh, uh, through our um, uh, social media. Uh, next up is Salim. Uh, he's representing his organization, Reimagining New uh, Communities. Uh, it is a peace building and communication organization based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And RNC uses storytelling, art, and art based approaches as a tool to tell and showcase stories of impact from, um, sorry. Uh, uh, impact from communities, organizations, and entities working towards attainment of sustainable development. Uh, then we have our organizing member, uh, Asfa Zera, who is the founding member for Pakistan Peace Club Foundation, PPC, which was founded in 2017. And PPC basically mobilizes youth uh, through networking, positive activities, and affiliate change uh, to engage them in stronger unified action for social and political change. Uh, then we have an organization for Venezuela. I'm sorry I didn't tell about my organization. Uh, Bidar Society is also from Pakistan. I'm, I'm from Pakistan. So uh, our next organization is Youth United in Action, uh, which is represented by our colleague uh, Dalia Marquez. And this organization is from Venezuela. And 
Youth United in Action, uh, it's an acronym and it's like, it's Joanna, J-U-E-N-A. It is a Spanish word, it's a Spanish acronym. And it is a nonprofit civil association which has been operating uh, since 2011 and legally registered in 2013. Uh, at the INGO level, uh, it, it is an organization at, at an INGO level, and their main headquarters are in Venezuela. So uh, they are basically they basically contribute uh, towards a group of their group of young people who are co co like determined to make this uh, world a better place. So that's about us. You can know more about us through our uh, social media channels or our website, which we will share at the end of this uh, session. So uh, over to uh, my colleague, Salim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, so I would like us to move um, to our agenda, the next item on our agenda. So in this um, meeting, we have a number of young people from different countries. And we are going to invite two or three of them to share perspectives from their countries on climate change, where, where um, what is the situation in their countries on climate change? What are they doing as individuals, as young people in their countries, as organizations, and what is their government doing? And what is also their commitment as we head to COP27 that will be happening in Egypt next month? So to start us with, I'll invite Dalia. She's from Venezuela, and she's going to share more about the work she's doing around climate change, environment, and what her country is also doing, and what are the challenges that they are facing as Venezuela. Welcome, um, Dalia. Thank you so much, Chalin, and you are for the coordination of this amazing meeting and this series of dialogues. Uh, I will stay with my camera off because of the connectivity here is really bad. So it's better to me if I stay with the camera off, if it is okay with all of you. It's okay? Okay, wonderful. So um, about climate change in the NGO that I represent, Youth United in Action or Juventud Unida en Acción in Spanish, we have been working since 2014 to promote different strategies in vulnerable communities to reduce the damage and to face the risk of climate change, especially in those communities that are vulnerable to being affected by the floods. At this moment, we are facing um, at national level, a terrible situation with floods. There are a lot of communities with a lot of losses, uh, material losses, but also uh, a lot of people is dying because of the floods the last two weeks in Venezuela. Therefore, we think and we really believe that capacity building and the creation of public policies to promote some options to face the different consequence of consequences of climate change is something that we have to do right now because climate change now it's a reality. A few years ago, we were talking about oh climate change. We need to reduce uh, all the things that increase the climate change. But now we really need to start to work into face the consequences of climate change because now it's a reality around the, around the world. Also, as an NGO uh, and myself, a uh, human rights defenders, we are focused on, on the promotion of advocate and also the promotion of the creation of public policies at local level to prevent the, the risk that, that climate change have in some communities. And in this sense, I want to highlight that almost all the time, the most vulnerable communities and the communities with the most difficult situations in economical terms are the ones most affected by climate change. Therefore, it's so important 
to create awareness about why we need to change of our lifestyles into sustainable lifestyles. Why we need to reduce our carbon footprint, by example. Because at the end, this is our common home. This world is our common home. And if we don't take any kind of action to reduce the pollution, to mitigate climate change, all of us will be affected at the end. But at the beginning, the most vulnerable people, the, the ones that have less opportunities to grow old in their communities will be the most affected. And I have to highlight that women, children, and youth are one of the population more affected. At this moment, in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean, we are living with um, something called like the climate refugees. This is because there is a lot of communities in Central America in which one life is impossible. The life there is impossible because of the constant consequences of the climate change. And people have to leave their homes and try to go to another countries, trying to find refugees to live in better conditions. And the highest population in these cases are women, children, and youth. And also indigenous communities are being affected by the consequences of the climate change. So for us, capacity building, it's important. Yes, the creation of public policies to mitigate, but also to face the consequences and reduce the damages of climate change are key. Are key. But the real change came with us. We need to shift our, our, our lifestyles for sustainable lifestyles, but also we need mm, real commitments in the high level decision making spaces. We need real commitments, by example, in the next COP27. We need more than conversations, more than beautiful conferences. We need commitments. We need uh, Biden agreements. We need real actions, more than words. And I think that this is all I want to say by the moment <laughs> to respect the time. And I really appreciate this invitation and the opportunity to be in here. In the COP27, I will be also as a speaker in several side events focused on ecocide, because ecocide as a crime is hand by hand with climate change. If we destroy uh, the nature and the natural spaces, at the end, we are increasing climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um... Dalia, you have mentioned a number of things. Uh, I'll be sure to come back to you to just be able to um, emphasize on some of the things you have talked about. But I totally agree with you, and I believe everybody in this um, forum also agree with you that we need um, real commitment from policymakers. We need um, real action and things that we can be able to move on and from policymakers and every player involved in climate change. So I would like to move on and invite my, um, my friend, um, Sharif from Somalia, share, to share his perspective on climate change from um, Somalia, from, uh, with a focus from Somalia. Welcome, Sharif. Um, thank you so much, Salim, and uh, good, e good evening, everyone, and uh, good morning, uh, good night, whatever time it is for you. I hope I'm very audible to everyone. Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, thank you so much again. Yeah, it's a pleasure again to be here with you, and uh, thank you so much for organizing this important discussion on a very significant topic. Uh, an issue that is uh, a concern for everyone now uh, around the globe. Uh, climate change has been an issue, uh, not only you know uh, globally, but also has been affecting the communities uh, and everyone, of course, uh, in, in this world and in our countries. 
uh, in Somalia and especially the region, in the Horn of Africa region, it has been uh, one of the major issues that has been talked recently. It is uh, because uh, as a result of the climate change, there has been uh, droughts that has affected uh, the region that we are living, especially in Somalia, Ethiopia, and also some parts of Kenya. Uh, that costed the, the lives of many people. Uh, in Somalia, uh, over 8 million have been affected by the droughts, which is as a result of uh, the climate shocks. Uh, and uh, we are also facing some uh, consequences like, you know, like failed rainy seasons. Now we are facing the fifth rainy season in Somalia. And uh, we uh, specifically can understand that it is also an issue that is related to the climate change that is affecting the whole globe. So uh, generally, uh, there are many, many other issues and many other effects that we can see. And those are, I think, some of the examples that we can say. But uh, in terms of uh, the awareness of the communities, the awareness of the governments, and the, you know, in terms of the policies, again, it seems that there are many gaps. There are many. Uh, you know, areas that uh, especially uh, the government is, are not addressing, are not giving their attention. Uh, so these discussions or such discussions will help that we get the attention of the decision makers, like the governments, that they come together and discuss, uh, especially uh, in, in the regions. Now it seems that even uh, though we understand that climate change is a major issue and yet countries are trying to address by their own, uh, you know, like uh, selves, but they are not coming together and discussing like, you know, in regions, con as continents, regions, whatever. So these kind of uh, discussions, I, 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 I believe that they bring together uh, the, the countries and the decision makers to take some actions. And it's not only the decision makers and the government that are supposed to make some actions on climate change, but also everyone, including of uh, you know, like these builders, like uh, you know, the group of youth like us, who can raise the awareness of the communities, and everyone understands you know their role regarding the climate change and what they can do about it. So uh, the Somali government is now prioritizing. Uh, climate change, they have now formed uh, a ministry which is specifically for, for this issue, which is called Environment and Climate Change Ministry. Uh, it is a new ministry and uh, now they have started some actions which include that they raised a campaign that uh, uh, like by the end of this year, thousand trees are planted in the country. Today, the campaign has started and it's officially launched by the president of the country. There are some progresses which we are seeing, but that is not still enough because of the, the, the understanding of the communities is still low and such discussions will improve and enhance the understanding of the people. So this is a very good discussion and I hope uh, that uh, we'll have more perspectives to share and discuss in, in, the, in the next few minutes. So yeah, those are the few remarks that I want to open with uh, the floor. So thank you so much and I hope to come back here. Yeah. Thank you, Salim and everyone. Thank you so much, Sharif. Thank you for a very good perspective on what is happening in Somalia. Of course, we want to hear more on what is happening and also your personal commitment um, in terms of climate change and also in terms of the COP27. Um, we want to focus more on what exactly can we expect from COP27, what is our commitment towards um, the discussion that will be going on and towards the issue around climate change. Um, I see my colleague Asifa, and I will just want to invite her to, you know, say a word before we continue, because we are moving to our panel discussion, and I want to believe all our panelists are in here, and they are amazing panelists, but before that, I want to invite Asifa, she's a journalist um, based in Pakistan, and she has done a lot of work around um, climate change, around um, issues um, to do with human rights, and so I just want to invite her to say a word or two before we move on to our panel discussion. Asifa? I guess, uh, first of all, I'm really sorry that I just um, reached home very late because of the uh, current situation happening in my country. So uh, accept my apologies, all of you. And yes, Salim, uh, our panelist, uh, uh, Abdul Basit Khan is here and Sajda Khalid has already joined us. Uh, I guess only one uh, panelist speaker, uh, she is um, uh, 
uh, Iman Dhanesh. She is not here. So maybe she'll join us in a while. So uh, thank you so very much. Everyone is here. So uh, and of course, accept my apologies first. So our purpose is here uh, on a platform is pretty clear and it is discussed a well, um, welcome note by the Selim and overall the discussion. And thank you, Sharif, uh, come up with a, a short notice. And I hope everybody has uh, seen the package report that we have uh, prepared it earlier and we have played it uh, i guess so uh, well uh, Salim, is it played or not because i joined very late not yet um yes <laughs> all right so uh, to all our uh, participants who are here so we have uh, prepared a package report in which i actually will go through the condition of uh, Pakistan after the floods because Pakistan is the country where we have faced massive destruction due to climate change. You know, um, in just five months, we have uh, forest fire, we have a certain uh, if events of gloom, we have flood been gone through the drought and there are lots more things so i hope our panel uh, panelists and the speakers will definitely cover this area and we have covered all these aspects in our package report so um, i just to be uh, i want selim to just go continue uh, our next session because uh, we are out of running time so that's it thank you so much asifa um, selim, i'm trying to, to thank you thank you so much I'm trying to uh, put the video on, so a little bit of technical issues, but Hiba, if you can be able to, if there is a way you can be able to help as we move on to the next session, then we can play it after this panel discussion. Good. Uh, I'm sorry, you want me to play the video? Yes, are you able to play from your end? Because I'm uh, facing some Let me just sort it out. Uh, you like, uh, do you want to uh, play the video right now? We can go on to the panel discussion as you figure that, that out. Yeah, yeah. You, you can uh, go for the panel discussion. I'll figure it out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, welcome. And I we have three amazing uh, panelists um, who we believe have great experience and insight on the subject matter that we are discussing tonight or this afternoon or this morning uh, um, based on your uh, time zone. So we have, um, I will just want to introduce them and then I'll give them two minutes each to talk about the work that they're doing and then their perspective and we'll move on to discuss more on, on, on our subject. So we have Abdul Basit. Abdul Basit is a Pakistanian um, environmental specialist, um, an environmental specialist expanding portfolio of government and World Bank funded project on water, agriculture, education, environment, and climate change sectors. We also have uh, Sajida Khalid, who is an environment, who, she's an environmentalist. So she has, uh, Sajida has done masters on in art systems, science from Middle East Technical University, Ankara, and bachelor's in environmental science from University of Karachi. She has been working as an environmental and science social expert for around eight years. Her areas of expertise lies in environmental impact, assessment and management, climate change and e ESG. She's from Pakistan as well. And then we have Iman Danish, who is I think running late, he has uh, seven, um, 11 years um, experience in eco entrepreneurship and founder of Earth Warriors Pakistan, a free to use climate education portal for children under 15 years of age. Iman is the youngest founder um, of Founder Institute graduate and an international recognized entrepreneurial program. Iman is also the youngest Pakistan to qualify from National Incubation Center Pakistan. Thank you so much. And I would like now to invite um, our first panelist, who is um, Abdul Basit. Yes, hello, everyone. Hello, Salim. Welcome, sir. Hello. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, I'm really excited to be in part of the seminar. Thank you. So, sir, you have two minutes to just talk more about your work and your involvement in climate change. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Salim. Uh, my, uh, I'm Abdul Basif Khan, and I've been working in uh, uh, Pakistan's development sector for more than uh, 10 years now. So uh, we are working on uh, uh, with the government, and currently I'm also based with the Asian Development Bank as environmental specialist. Uh, so uh, we are looking into the development portfolio of climate change and water sector, education, uh, energy. Uh, so the problem lies that uh, we are actually, you know, uh, one of those developing countries who are facing lack of funds, who are like, uh, lacking. Uh, new technologies, adapting new technologies. Uh, so it takes uh, a lot of impact here. So we are facing, uh, you know, climate change scenarios. And uh, nevertheless, uh, we are looking into the matters of uh, the environmental deterioration. So as part of a development sector, it's our job to, uh, to propose best solutions that can uh, in, in less cost and less, uh, you know, interventions, we can uh, gain more better products and better uh, developments in, in the run. So that's what we do. Uh, and also looking after the environmental uh, safeguards of, on the projects so that they have less and less impact. And of course, sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll now invite um, Sajida. Hello, uh, I'm Sajida Khalid from Pakistan. I am an environmentalist by profession, as uh, you have already mentioned. I have been working in the sector for around eight years, and <laughs> I have mostly worked. <coughs> Sorry. As an environmental and social expert, uh, earlier we have been targeting the private sector for the most part, and now we're, uh, working with the public uh, sector projects as well. And uh, mostly involved in uh, providing in consultation towards uh, uh, consultation on the projects when, when there are IFE and other DFIDs working as transaction advisory, uh, as they are very concerned about uh, environment and social perspectives. So uh, we, we conduct assessments and prepare reports for the clients uh, and make sure that the projects don't lead to any negative impact on the environment and uh, protect the climate, uh, reduce the impact on climate change as well. Besides these, I'm also working as a um, uh, kind of trainer and uh, facilitator for climate change related uh, awareness building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing, Sajira. Um, so I'll just start, want to start with you. So what, based on looking at COP27 that is happening next month, what do you think are some of the most success? What do you think this kind of meeting has been able to bring? What kind of successes has this meeting uh, brought over the year since it started? Now we are going into COP27. What are some of the takeaways that you can say that since we started COP from COP1 or whenever we started it, that this has been the success story of these meetings? Given uh, this uh, COP27, uh, as we concern the case of Pakistan, uh, more than success story, I'm more, more concerned towards the uh, what the outcomes will be given the fact that we have already hit, hit by the, uh, in fact, worst hit by the impacts of climate change. And even in the past, there have been efforts, there have been uh, initiatives identified and uh, country nations have also uh, worked towards them as well. But now this is the time we have to identify and we have to figure, except basically uh, that we are paying the cost of the actions done by other nations as well. Because as Pakistan is a developing nation, uh, its contribution towards the greenhouse emissions is already very restricted. And uh, it's mostly the transboundary impacts and other uh, climate global impacts that have been, uh, that we are paying the cost for it. So, uh, Besides the what, uh, besides the success stories and besides the journey that we have covered from COP, COP one to COP twenty seven, 
as uh, as an environment as as an as a professional i am more concerned on uh, what out what outcomes will come from this uh, uh, conference of parties and uh, if, if we are able to make other nations realize that the uh, actions of the developed countries are now impacting the environment and um, uh, what you can say economy and uh, 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 give, like worse hitting the, uh, the developing countries for the most part who are not able who are not who was resi resilience is low and who are not able to afford to bear the risks of climate change on their own thank you so much um basit i'll come to you and my question will be from just what sajida has talked about is um do you think um, the conference of parties has been able to really hold accountable to the develop, developed countries in terms of the emissions, in terms of um, the causes and everything that um, comes with the climate change? Do you think this kind of meeting has been able to really hold the development countries to commit themselves towards you know, the um, resolutions and, and towards the outcomes that I've been talking about? Thank you, Salim. Uh, yeah, uh, I do understand that uh, it's it's actually too uh, too ambitious at times uh, to declare that, but also alarming at the same time. Uh, we can really achieve this or not. So the thing is that are we really able to do that in in a particular time? As the uh, the target was to restrict the um, uh, you know the mean temperature within 1.5 degrees Celsius. So, but already we are past that target. So is that, uh, you know, we are, we are going that and looking into the climate change events in the past uh, two years and three years, uh, we saw tremendous cyclones and, uh, you know, tremendous effects of droughts. We, we saw, uh, you know, a, a lot of change there. But on the other end, the, on the positive note of that, uh, the developing countries uh, did take a step ahead. They did uh, start thinking over it. Uh, this was the year, uh, the last year was, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan. For the first time, it, it hosted the World Environment Day. And uh, we, in Pakistan, we, uh, you know, proceeded for the 10,000 billion tree program, which, uh, which was, a, uh, you know, initiative of the government to plant uh, good trees and, uh, you know, uh, in numerous places. And that uh, it definitely showed some good uh, results in the end also. But on, uh, we definitely look forward to it that, you know, now the private sector, the industrialists, the agriculture sector, uh, the irrigation power energy sectors, they all are now pitching in. Now they, uh, the, uh, the, the offices which I work with, they're now really talking about, uh, you know, bringing in the change that until unless there is no climate change intervention uh, or some adaptation or mitigation in the projects, they're not going to bring finance or funds into that. So this is something which is, you know, encouraging on a sustainable manner. And uh, we are looking into wonderful solutions now. We are going for biosaline agriculture. We are looking into, uh, you know, less water requiring crops. We are looking into uh, hydroponics. We are looking into uh, you know, inland for fisheries and uh, a lot is, you know, working on that front. So uh, I, I am a bit positive on this side that, you know, coming together on a global scale, especially in the COPs, uh, that is something, you know, they're promising, they're they are bringing their NTDCs in front, uh, so uh, their, their national commitments. So uh, that is something which is somewhere in promising. And in the past, we did not see uh, happening in the real way. Much thank you. And this, yeah, I, I like everything. Also, one thing that I like to pick up from where you ended, in terms of the national commitments. And I'd just like you to, if you you are aware of any national um, commitments, if you can highlight some of the struggles with the developed with the developing world to keep up with the national commitments towards climate change. And Sajida can also talk about this. Welcome, Basi. Uh, yes, uh, I'll um, just you know talk about a few points, and then uh, my colleague can. 
uh, contribute into that. Uh, on the government scale, first I'll talk about some government scale and then I'll talk about some, you know, uh, some regional uh, actions that have been taken so far. And I'm talking about Pakistan's per perspective. Uh, electrical vehicles, uh, first, they were never talked about uh, in Pakistan, but now uh, there are, uh, you know, there is a hype uh, that, uh, you know, electrical vehicles are coming into the policy. There, there has been a policy where they have actually talked about bringing in uh, to reduce the impact on fuel. Uh, solar energy, solar plants uh, are encouraged too much. They are incentivized now, and, and the banks are supporting those uh, infrastructures to be placed into the country. So that is something, a positive return. And now they're also, uh, you know, mo move towards net metering, which means that you produce electricity from solar power and uh, you can revert, return that uh, excess uh, energy in the national grid and they will pay you uh, some amount on that. So this is something encouraging for the people. Uh, secondly, uh, we also have, uh, you know, worked towards uh, carbon emissions, uh, you know, how to tackle uh, the resources, the net zero transition, uh, bringing in together that uh, some industries waste can actually be uh, the raw material for another product or industry. So that is, uh, that is in the pipeline, it is being worked. And even uh, solid waste management where uh, waste to energy is also a, a concept which is being, bring, uh, you know, being worked upon. And similarly, uh, uh, you know, the alternative uh, resources for, because we are an agriculture intensive country. So in that context, we are working towards much uh, better climate smart actions that can promote uh, sustainable agriculture, climate smart agriculture, and also uh, for our mangroves, uh, that is also part of our ecosystem. So those initiatives have already been there and uh, part of the, NT, uh, the national commitments. And let's see how it goes down the road. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sajida. Uh, yes, further adding to Abdul Basit, there, uh, there are the initiatives that have been taken and uh, some of them are already in pipeline. There is a Recharge Pakistan project that is uh, already in progress, which aims to, you know, uh, for integrated flood risk management, and uh, to recharge, um, so it will actually help us to uh, use, our, use the, uh, the water that is causing the flood, will go back to the groundwater and uh, uh, you know, elevate the water table levels. Then there are uh, some nature-based uh, nature solutions which have been identified under the uh, adaptation actions for Paris Agreement, meeting the requirements of Paris Agreement. So there is the ecosystem Restoration initiative. There is the there are the uh, initiative for uh, protected areas, which is the project which is going to end in the next year. And there are some other projects. Uh, uh, Ten billion pre tsunami project. Uh, we are already working in uh, improving our uh, share for uh, renewable energy. Until 2019, there was no data available for solar and biogas. But now there are more projects and the data is also available. Uh, gender, uh, we are also working on integrating the social aspects of, uh, of this climate change uh, dimensions. And we, uh, we are working on gender mainstreaming, identifying how climate justice uh, re uh, leads to, you know, um, help in reduction of gender mainstreaming. Uh, health impacts have been identified uh, in KPK in Punjab province much work have been done in the health sector. And there's some other activities there, uh, new opportunities, ha opportunities have been identified for youth to come forward and uh, uh, bring solutions for resolving climate change. Moreover, we are also working on, uh, it's just uh, one uh, point I would like to integrate more. We are now working on integrating the life cycle in, uh, component into our projects and now uh, more focused on end-to-end -end assessments of resource use, waste, and ret uh, returns to, uh, returns of the waste to the nature, uh, returning them in the best forms. 
thank you so okay. much. Good, very good perspective. Um, I, I like to bring in Dalia to just talk about also maybe Venezuela's um, national commitments and Sharif briefly, what are some of the commitments at the national level um, towards climate change? So Dalia. Or Sharif, if you are. Okay, great. So um, I think when we're still looking for them. Um, okay, Sharif, yes, come. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Salim, thank you so much. Sharif, yes. uh, the, the, the national governments can have Salim, if you allow me, I can add one point here regarding Pakistan as well, since uh, Dalia and Sharif are trying to fix their internet connection. Okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I just, uh, like, our experts can, uh, like, add in something here as well. Um, since, uh, along with the climate change, Pakistan had been seeing, uh, actually, the world has been seeing a lot of uh, energy issues as well, right? So uh, we have this authority which uh, like which was launched like a uh, further like some time back but it ha it is now uh, working on several uh, new policies which is it, it is called national energy efficiency and Con Con uh, conservation authority under that they are trying to uh, like formulate many other things because energy working on the energy and energy crisis has like goes hand in hand with the climate change and climate issues as well so uh, the electric vehicle thing the electric public transport and having the uh, climate uh, related uh, study material and in the schools and the uh, curriculum as well so these are the policies that they are also trying to work on so that we like you know we uh, fix all of this from the very early stage because right now when we talk about saving the climate saving the environment uh, our kids really don't know what we are talking about and it is it is some kind of discussion which is involved uh, between uh, like you know experts or the senior people so we need to tell our children from the early age that uh, like how to take care of the environment so that we can curtail this uh, climate change issue uh, at this moment, like, you know, at least stop it, whatever has happened. So there are a few more policies that are in like uh, in uh, process right now as well in Pakistan. Thank you so much. Um, Dalia, are you, are you able to now to share? Yes, I am here. Can you please repeat the, the question, Charlene? Yes, the question is, um, so what are some of the national commitments by um, Venezuela and any other country that you have interacted with in South America? Well, uh, about the, the commitments that Venezuela as, as a country are yes. making broad to the COP27, I don't have too much clarity about this topic because in Venezuela to talk about climate change is, a, is something really hard, especially because as maybe you know, Venezuela is historically recognized because of, of, the, it's of the extractive activities that, that we do as a country. So I don't have clarity about the commitments of Venezuela as a country, about the civil society, that is the field in which one I am. Uh, uh, I know that civil society has a lot of different strategies to face climate change, especially we are focused uh, on the world to advocate for the creation of public policies to reduce destructive activities around the country because at this moment, there is 12% of the national territory uh, used to extractive activities. So what cyber society is doing is trying to change that pattern um, of 
consumption and that pattern of economy of Venezuela and change it for other things that can bring us also uh, possibilities and opportunities to our economy, by example, sustainable tourism. It's a good idea because we are a country with a lot of beautiful places. So if we invest more in sustainable tourism and less in extractive activities, this will be good. But at the same time, in this topic, I want to highlight that almost all the time, the developing countries that in this case, Venezuela is a developing country. So we have the extractive activity as a possibility to maintain our economies. And the developed countries are, in my personal perspective, the ones that have to try to support and to share technologies and knowledge with the developing countries to achieve the sustainable development and to achieve the economies for sustainable economies, for circular economies. Because for the developing countries, it's really hard to face all the crisis, the economical crisis, uh, all the situation with the climate change. In the case of Venezuela, we are going through an humanitarian crisis. So it's really hard for Venezuela as a country to set some real commitments by example, uh, not use uh, fossil fuels in the next 10 years. It's really hard because we don't have the technologies, we don't have the, the economies to face this kind of changes. So there is so important the South Sur, North Sur and triangular cooperation between the different countries. Yeah, that's it from my side. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Sharif, thank you, Dalia. That, that was very incredible. Thank you for sharing. Sharif, do you have anything to say? Uh, yes, Salim. I hope now I can be happy. Yes, yes, uh, yes. yes great. Thank you. Uh, in, in Somalia, we have now a new leadership that is very committed in this sector, especially in climate change and the protection of the environment and whatever they can do about it. But again, there are many challenges that the new leadership is facing, including that there are no uh, policies in place that has been uh, that has existed before. Uh, whether it is like uh, the policies, as Hiba was talking about, there are some uh, like uh, policies that are very, very basic in terms of, for example, like uh, uh, electrical, educational, charcoal, you know, like what to use. And, uh, you know, imagine, I want you to imagine the, these, the developing countries, especially like uh, Somalia, so Sudan, and all these countries, which the situation of the living situation is very, very low where people are still using charcoal and woods for like maybe cooking and for things like that, rather than, you know, like the gas, all these things. So all these sectors and all these basic area, uh, you know, things need uh, policies, you know, like that uh, the deforestation should be stopped, you know, like uh, enhancing the use of gas and all those things rather than like using the charcoal, the woods, all these things, because of all this encourage the cutting the trees and all these things, which are still very, very uh, visible and found in, uh, in the country and also in the region. Uh, hopefully you're aware of that. So there are many commitments, but in terms of the implementation is still, uh, they are very low. There are, uh, you know, because of the government size still uh, suffering with, you know, how to implement these things, how to develop relevant policies which are not only, you know, like transformed from, uh, you know, like the developed countries, but which, uh, you know, like reflect the, the contexts uh, that uh, they, they lead. And the other most important thing is also like uh, the budget, you know, in, in, in Somalia and maybe in the other uh, countries, in the neighboring countries, very, very difficult that governments have uh, budgets uh, or priorities for this uh, issue. And uh, that can also uh, be seen in, in the current, for example, now we have a new ministry, uh, which is specifically for this issue, but the ministry doesn't have enough budget to address all these things or to develop maybe like, or to have technical team that uh, raises all these campaigns or that uh, those needs or maybe like writes the policies that, that are needed. So uh, one thing that uh, maybe like the governments could go and take to the COP 20, 27, uh, uh, to, uh, 27 is that 
maybe uh, they ask also some sort of not only budget, but also technical support in having relevant policies uh, for the specific countries, especially for the, for developing countries, uh, uh, the the Horn of Africa, uh, you know, Africa in general, uh, you know, so, uh, Asia, and all those countries. So again, that is an, an an important sector that I wanted to emphasize, and I also agree, Hiba, that uh, it's also important that we start from the ground, that we teach the kids, you know, the people at the school, that this is important, that they at least understand and take part, you know, like the protection of the environment. That also helps quite a lot. Uh, uh, you know, comparing to maybe something bringing like a policy and enforcing that people do it. So that is also another strategy that the government is kind of put in place. Yeah, that is what I wanted to. Thank you so much. Um, talking about, um, you know, just getting to work from the grassroots or talk, talk um, you know, working from, you know, making sure that children of our communities understand the effect of climate change and their role. I would like to invite um, Iman Danish to just talk about what she's doing um, with, because she's from um, our her profile and what I read to you, um, she's, she works, she, um, sorry, let me, getting it. So Iman Danish Khan, uh, Khan is an 11 year old um, ecopreneur and founder of Earth Warriors Pakistan, a free to use climate education portal for children under uh, 15 years of age. So I would like to invite you um, Iman to just talk about what you do um, with young people um, in line with the climate change and also, um, you know, mainstream being able to tweak in the issue of entrepreneurship, the issues of uh, making money, you no know, economic sense to all this um, discussion about climate change. Welcome. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes, 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 okay. can hear you. So hello everyone, my name is Iman Danishkhan and I'm the founder of Earth Warriors Pakistan. I'm an 11 year old homeschooler which is born in Karachi and I'm currently based in the UAE. So basically Earth Warriors Pakistan is a free to use climate education portal designed for children under 15 years of age. It teaches children all about climate change through an eco-friendly superhero <coughs> Sorry about that. Through an eco-friendly superhero called Fiza, uh, which teaches children about climate change in a fun manner so children don't get bored. Since, you know, like if you hand a child a textbook and expect them to read and suck up all of that knowledge, high percent, uh, it's a really high chance that they won't do that. So basically, Earth Warrior Pakistan illustrates climate education in a fun way through animated stories Te uh, textbooks and various animated videos and a fun expert talk. So the portal is available to www.earthwarriors.org. So the reason why I think that climate, change, uh, climate education is really important, like you might say that, like how is climate change important, uh, climate education important? I believe that if you don't know about a topic, then like you can't teach it and uh, like you can't do anything about it if you don't know about it like for example if you don't know english you can't te teach english <coughs> so basically that's what i have to say on climate education so thank you everyone for listening and goodbye Thank you so much. You are doing an amazing work. Um, Basit, I just want to come back to you. Looking at what Iman is doing, you know, that bringing fun to uh, climate education, then why is it difficult that um, grown-ups find it difficult to engage in this conversation about climate change? Why is it left to a certain group of people to talk about climate change? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, nice to meet you, Iman, and your work is splendid. So keep on this great work. Uh, yeah, definitely, Sarin, uh, this is a very crucial question which you have just asked. Uh, you know, uh, that one of the reasons which I believe in is that uh, we 
uh, or or at least our the first generations, they were more economic oriented, and there was no uh, you know full stop that uh, uh, what there is next uh, after making uh, great money, great industries, and you know that was uh, seen as a symbol of development. Uh, and then uh, definitely there came a time when they actually started realize that no, uh, the economics does not mean that you have infinite resources. It means that you have a resource and then you're returning back in an, another bad state. That's where the question mark came in and we started to think about it. But this uh, seemed to be very quite hypothetical. They did not really believe in what we were trying to advocate. So uh, this is something which has uh, kept lingering on. And if you believe uh, in, in the Kyoto Protocol, uh, one of, uh, or a couple of uh, you know, developed countries, they stepped back, they did not sign uh, that protocol. Why? Because they felt threatened, or maybe they were not too sure that maybe that was something was targeting towards their economic development. So yeah. Uh, you know, we are actually given that facade, we are given that uh, image of development and, and you know, lavish lifestyles, uh, which actually makes us, uh, you know, uh, ignorant or naive enough not to understand this difference. And yes, uh, I, I just had a talk with some children today uh, of grade six, and they were doing splendid works in recycling and, you know, they are more energetic, more enthusiastic, more understanding about the grave circumstances climate change is bringing in. So in that context, uh, it's, uh, I think they, they are the future, not us. So they are, uh, you know, they have much understanding uh, and they are looking into the things, the, the frequent cyclones, the, the droughts conditions and uh, erratic behavior of the weather patterns. So they are witnessing it already. And uh, we don't have much to uh, defend ourselves. We don't have much to say in, in the defense of what we were doing in the past few years. So yeah, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I don't blame the literacy. Literacy has no role in this. It's just uh, you know common sense if some people have to uh, acquire that, that's all. Thank you so much. You, you have discussed, you have brought in a number of things talking about that children are the future to, um, you know, this discussion on fighting climate change. You have talked about the issue of literacy, um, you know, illiteracy or just being able to understand how, you know, even on climate change, when there is a situation in your community. But how then, um, and this can, um, you can answer this and also Sajida can answer the end demand. How then do we ensure that all the developing countries or majority of it can be able to adopt, you know, kind of new techniques like what Iman is doing and most of you and most of us, what we are doing. What can we do to ensure that our development countries adopt those kind of techniques to involve more uh, community members, schools and society in climate um, change discussion? Uh, okay, I'll answer that uh, in, uh, quickly, uh, just to save time. And then uh, my colleague can answer that too. Number one, I believe in networking. Uh, you know, we all should come together and learn from each other's experience. Uh, and today, I'm really happy that we are from different, uh, you know, parts of the world and talking about ideas. Definitely what you are doing there uh, might be, you know, closely related in, uh, in, eco in ecological terms or maybe in, in types of the biomes which we share. So uh, definitely we can share those ideas. Like I was talking about Biosaline agriculture, that is something which Australia is, uh, you know, uh, prospering in. Uh, we can also take the ideas of hydroponics. Many of the countries are already doing that. And similarly, from Pakistan, you can take ideas to your country and uh, see how we are dealing with, uh, uh, with water resources or conservation. So, you know, we can exchange ideas there and bring uh, bring common knowledge and I, I you know like we are adopting electrical vehicles that is something coming from the developed side so yeah so sharing and networking that is something very important and secondly what i believe is that you know we should not stop here we should just you know uh, advocate as much as possible advocacy is the tool uh, which we can use by uh, bringing it to the other fronts 
and the third thing which I like to actually uh, I voice it out a lot is that the ownership of your your area or ownership of ecosystem services which you have and then uh, the bridging of knowledge the bridging of knowledge between academics researchers r d government public sector industrialist that should you know come together they should not think in isolation they should come together and think that what new developments can be brought in thank you that's from my side Thank you. Thank you so Iman. much, Abdul Basit. Oh, uh, can I answer? Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, so much, Abdul Basit, for a very comprehensive yet uh, covering it in a very um, quick manner. Uh, basically, these are all the points that were in my mind. Uh, and the uh, one approach that I always uh, believe and I always advocate is uh, promoting transdisciplinary approaches to education at all levels, at elementary level, at college, high school level, at university level. Because our professionals, when they uh, graduate from a certain field, they are basically very rigid towards that field. A uh, business ma uh, man is more about, a person uh, graduating from business is more concerned towards the development as uh, aspect uh, and environmentalist is more rigid towards the environment aspect. But basically the need of the time is we have to uh, think holistically and take holistic actions. And this can only be done when we uh, go towards interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches to edu education. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Iman? Uh, I'm over it. I'm over the question again. So how do you ensure that the um, that developed countries continue to learn to develop the kind of um, techniques that you have come up with or the innovation you have come up with to involve children, but also involve more communities in discussions around climate change and solutions, especially. Um, so like, like, um, shadow on what Abdul Basil uh, said. Um, so like, we should like really exchange stuff and like, learn stuff from our history like sometimes i've seen a lot that history repeats itself so we need to like distance ourselves from doing the things that we have done before and that led us to like a bad end so and the thing for uh, the developing countries we also need to take many ideas from like developed countries uh, like the West, for example, electric cars that like we're taking and like many other things like we really need uh, to take in. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to invite, we are getting into Q&A, so I want to invite anyone um, who has any question or comment uh, from the discussion that we have had, we are coming close to our um, our forum. So I want to invite anyone who has a question. You you can shoot your question. Uh, I'm sorry, Salim. We have one video that we had to show. Uh, so I can do that, and then we can yes. move towards the Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you are ready with the video, we can show the video. And then those who have questions, you can chat your question or you can raise your hand and then we'll be able to.
Shiba, I, I think there is no sound to the video. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, is the video meant to make any sound? Because, like, there wasn't any. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, there's no voice? Yes, there was no audio. No, no. Okay, uh, I guess let's move towards the uh, QA session and then I can share the link of the video in the chat box if that's fine. Great. Thank you for that. So is there any question? Um, anyone who has a question? Um, basically, I have a question with Abdul Basit. Uh, Abdul Basit said, um, actually, basically, the less development countries such as Pakistan, Niger, Kenya, Somalia, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan, and so other countries are facing um, the climate change uh, most. Uh, so um, how these countries can shift their uh, resources, such as Abdul Basit said, then we can switch uh, from electrical vehicle and we can uh, implement the policy of solar system. So how is it possible, the whole scenario, because it needs lots of money. So how is it possible? Because the solution, uh, come up with a solution and advices are very, very easy. But how we can implement these things in our countries, such as, uh, as I discussed, Pakistan, Kenya, Niger, and other countries. Okay, thank you, Asfa, for your uh, question. And uh, I'm really glad to say that, you know, uh, working with the government bodies and uh, government agencies, uh, with the donor funding, uh, you know, agencies as well, what's happening right now is that, you know, they have brought this condition, they have brought this important, uh, you know, aspects into their, uh, you know, regime that until unless you don't have a climate change uh, adaptation or mitigation policy, you don't have something uh, contributing towards the environment, any part of the project. So there is a particular component which is uh, financed and it is mandatory to you know, follow that. Uh, like I, I was doing one project for education uh, department in Punjab and there was uh, uh, this uh, plan of constructing uh, about uh, 60,000 uh, new schools and classrooms. So uh, now this seems to be a project where you're just constructing buildings, but uh, the World Bank was financing that project and the environmental uh, policies were triggered. They said that until unless there is no provision of solar panels into those, into those buildings, those buildings are not designed into the, uh, considering the environmental aspects of uh, like natural lighting, uh, clean water, uh, wash facilities. Uh, so that, uh, you know, they won't be really funding into uh, the project until unless these are not insured into the design. So that is a small part maybe, but that is some way we can, you know, start achieving those targets. Secondly, we are also signatories for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. So that is also uh, an annual report is being published on that, where we are displaying that what type of uh, projects and uh, interventions have been taken by the government, which is actually contributing towards those targets. So uh, in my experience, uh, we are looking this on the on the table. We are looking it into uh, the projects which are being financed. So things are coming up in in that context. So uh, yes, it is true. Uh, we are taking baby steps right now, but uh, it's going to bloom very very soon. So uh, things might be coming up like that. <laughs> uh, so we have to stay positive. And yes, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation designs. Uh, from uh, from different agencies are also being adapted. Like we had floods, uh, recent floods. So uh, now they are they are promoting new uh, you know flood resilient uh, buildings designs so that they're not damaged if there is an event of a flood. So that our communities which are so much disturbed right now uh, they can start you know uh, stay safe in a while. So uh, th things like that uh, are coming up. Uh, where it's not too prominent, it will take time. But uh, because our country is too large and uh, up to, uh, a bigger population to care of, but uh, nevertheless, uh, things are uh, you know coming up slow and slow. 
Well, uh, I also want to, uh, to add something in um, electrical vehicle and other things. So Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and so many other countries, they have millions of people who travel daily. Um, so uh, to all the poverty um, you're having some internet problems. I, I think we lost you. And, um, is it possible or not? Will you repeat your question? Because no, it is another perspective that he's working on, on uh, some kind of international forum so is it possible if the country ban uh, the private work for these country and he have some different kind of sanctions so is it possible that uh, somebody uh... sorry i think we we lost you uh, can can you write your question asifa in the chat box um anyone else with a, with a question uh there's no question okay. but uh, uh can, okay. sorry sir. can you can you write your question in the chat box yes i i will i will okay i do you. it yeah sajira Okay, meanwhile, she's writing the question, uh, just to add to her, uh, what I got actually getting from her question, uh, the, her previous question is, uh, see, uh, there, there are issues, there are uh, financial limitations, uh, and yes, they are there, but still there are opportunities, we have research opportunities, we have growth opportunities, and uh, not everything falls into the responsibility of government. Uh, they, uh, there are huge investments from private sector. There are learning opportunities from private sector as well. So uh, what we need to do is to invest our energy in research because uh, you know there are fundings, there are opportunities, but since people are not so much interested in uh, advancing research, so the opportunities are usually grabbed by the people who uh, are more focused in building their names instead of uh, you know, enhancing the research aspects. So uh, not, uh, not every uh, responsibility falls on the government, not every responsibility falls on, fall on the shoulder of uh, regulatory authorities. It, some, uh, some share has to be done by us because uh, the change comes only when there are collective efforts. Thank you so much, thank you. I, I like the fact that you emphasized on the need for research. Um, thank you. Anyone else? Any other question or comment? Great. So before I take this back to Hiba, and I just want us to have a round of um, you know, comments as we close this. So um, Basit, Eman, uh, Mohammed, Sajida, and Dalia, what are your key expectations next month in Egypt? Okay, not, shall I go ahead? <laughs> Sorry, uh, Basi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sajda. Yes, actually, I think uh, we should, you know, keep the balance of uh, pragmatism and humor. So, uh, you know, uh, see, definitely everyone is coming uh, from different countries, and uh, it's very evident that what's happening in the world. Uh, so, you know, uh, now if they are not really in uh, taking. Uh, sensitive and pragmatic measures, 
then I think they, uh, they, they really have to, you know, uh, defend themselves because uh, uh, climate action march have been happening all over the world. Uh, even Pakistan has uh, faced, uh, you know, uh, our activists uh, came out on the roads and they started speaking about it. So uh, it's, it's a no-go now. Uh, we need answers. We need solutions. In that aspect, I, I believe that, you know, it's, it's very necessary uh, that the, uh, the uh, commitments, the governments which are bringing the delegates who are coming there, they should now sit down and negotiate what are the best possible actions which can be taken and not only for the sake of money and development, rather that should be taken and for, for, you know, the, uh, for the betterment of the future generations coming uh, for, and especially the food security, the water security, climate is definitely affecting, but uh, the more matters in hand are, are these issues, uh, which are actually the basic necessities of life. Uh, so in that context, you know, uh, they should start talking about it, be really, 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 uh, you know, realistic and holistic that uh, where are we taking the, uh, the direction? Are we really into this? And uh, I, I see that, you know, uh, hundreds of delegates are reaching uh, to attend the COP. Uh, what about, uh, uh, you know, since we are today, we, we are talking from uh, different corners of the world, why cannot they? Uh, why are they uh, spending so much fuel, aviation fuel and, uh, you know, uh, they are uh, traveling all over the world and uh, causing so much carbon emission and then talking on the table. So that is something, you know, people should really open their eyes on uh, rather than uh, exploring in tourism or doing uh, things like that. They should also uh, be really, uh, after COVID, I think this is a new norm. Uh, we are sitting on different corners of the world and we are talking it very freely and very easily. And actually we are saving time uh, in, in very less time. I think we discussed a lot of many aspects. So that should be, you know, the key notes. And I'm, I'm positive in the sense that uh, this time, if there are people to negotiate, uh, they, are, uh, they have already lessons learned. Uh, they're not coming with a fresh mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Iman? Um, yeah, so what I expect from uh, COP this year, so what I expect is some good policies. Uh, COP has many amazing policies, don't get me wrong, but there are some factors that we have not looked into and that are like less acknowledged, but we really, really need to talk about them. For example, a food waste. I was at El Coy um, a few weeks ago, uh, so... So like, but uh, so like food waste is a really, really big problem and we really need to talk about it because it is contributing a lot to climate change. Since like when food is wasted and it's mostly dumped into the oceans and uh, like it, when it decomposes without oxygen, it releases methane, which is like 10 times more effective, uh, um, a more effective gas in trapping uh, like, heat in the earth so we really need to like focus on small problems that actually make a big difference so yeah that's kind of what i want to say thank you thank you so much um sharif sharif dalia as Sharif prepares to come. Yes, thank you, Sharif. Can you please repeat the, the last question? So you actually will be there in person in Egypt next month. What are your expectations? What um, are you looking forward to? You know, the key takeaways that you expect to come from um, Egypt next month. Okay, so my expectation, well, I have been the last 10 years focused on policy and advocate for environment and participating in different international decision-making spaces like the United Nations Environmental Assemblies and COPs. At the moment, 
if we see the history of the international environmental law, we have achieved use a few things. By the moment, we have been going through the last 50 years with different conferences, summits, etc. since 1972, but we are facing climate change, loss of biodiversity, desertification, pollution, among mean, we are facing a triple planetary crisis. So about my expectations, I have to say that I have a few ones, just a few expectations for this COP. At least I hope this time the, the states, the member states and all the parties participating there um, uh, set some uh, commitments more than you know, beautiful agreements like the Paris Agreement, we need real commitments. If we don't start to set commitments and take actions now, we will be doing this at the last 50 years and in the next 50 years, future generations will be facing with a terrible environmental situation. So, I don't have a lot of expectatives about this meeting. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a bad thing, but I, I am trying to be really realistic at this moment. But at least I suppose that the member states and the parties participating there um, will set some commitments and, and actions with indicators to follow the achievement of the commitments uh, set it out in that meeting. So just to uh, you know yes, uh, yes, uh, continue this, actually I I think uh, we are you know quite uh, uh, disappointed already. So but you know uh, it's it's the winner attitude. Uh, attitude is altitude. So uh, we have to you know be very positive about this. Secondly, uh, looking into the comment Jack Tone has uh, uh, you know asked here. Uh, what governments can do to ensure the most of its population are actively involved. Uh, you know, every uh, it is human nature. We actually work on the principle of either corrective actions or preventive actions. So uh, we can take the preventive actions. We can, uh, you know, impose, uh, you know, better solutions, make them used to them, or uh, like like it was for traffic signals. At times, uh, you know, uh, it is imposed for the safety of the people and the drivers, but uh, there are people who just, you know, violate the traffic rules and they just pass uh, through the signals. So uh, then we come for the co uh, corrective action. Corrective is like imposing fines and capturing them and stuff like that. So a similar nature is uh, for, you know, ev everyone when we talk about environment and their, and their uh, proactive actions, which we can take. So um, uh, especially it goes for the industries, the, the business uh, community, uh, how they are actually taking ownership on that because they are uh, quite much of the uh, vocal people in the community. So they should advocate that. Uh, once we tap into that resource, uh, a much can you know, easily follow. Uh, that's from my side, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you I just know, wanted to I'm sorry, uh, quickly add one expectation that I'm expecting because I want to be as positive as I am. Um, I'm expecting because um, uh, I hope everyone knows this, but uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan is jointly co-chairing uh, COP27. So I really hope that there is going to be a discussion around uh, climate action equality, which everyone needs, because uh, what Pakistan suffered through in the past three to four months is severe damage. So we are looking at uh, damage and loss part in the COP27. So I really hope there's a discussion around that because Pakistan is one of the countries which uh, has carbon emission below 1%. So uh, why are we facing this is because there is uh, like action inequality. Uh, Developed nations are not doing as much as the underdeveloped or uh, developing nations. So we, we, uh, I really think that there is going to be a discussion around that part. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I, I like, I see how all of us wants to be positive, but there is, and you sound very diplomatic, but that's not how Sajida actually sounded. So Sajida, what, what are your expectations next month? <laughs> Uh, so practically speaking, uh, I believe uh, there should be, you know, uh, some, uh, I, I never say that uh, all the developed countries should stop their operations, but, you know, taking responsibility. So uh, I believe there should be a middle ground identified. Uh, investing in the developed countries, uh, need to understand how, how and where they can fund and support developing countries in building their resilience and their capacity building to you know uh, combat the impacts of climate change because as we understand uh, the impacts of climate uh, the extent to which we uh, ex experience the impacts of climate change are directly proportional to you know um, are the in better in income levels so the more uh, resilient, uh, the more developed you are, the more economically strong you are, you, you have the resources to combat the impacts of negative events, or you can uh, uh, recover from the negative impacts quickly. So we need, uh, from the next uh, COP27 next month, I believe there will be some uh, better interventions in terms of identifying responsibilities, identifying the impacts that other countries are having, identifying a balance which can be achieved. So, you know, development should be for all of the nations globally. That's all from my side. Thank you so much, Ajira. We have four minutes to wrap up our wonderful conversation. Um, I see Dahlia, your hand is up. Do you wanna say something? Yes, I want to highlight that it would be great for this COP to set mm, some kind of commitments and also realize that we don't have to be too much ambitious. We just have to be realistic and set uh, achievable commitments because what I have been seeing in the last conference, Global International Conference, is that member states and please try to set really beautiful and amazing commitments, but are impossible to achieve facing all the different situations around the world. So um, I would like to promote being realistic, considering the reality of developing countries and promote partnership and international cooperation between developed countries and developing countries and include the voices of civil society in the creation of public policies to face climate change. Because something that I want to highlight is that civil society have been too active in this process. Children and youth as, as an escape holder have been too involved in all the process brought to the COP. And this is something beautiful. The partnerships that civil society are doing with governments, local governments, private industries, etc., is something beautiful. And we have to take this energy, put it on the local uh, spaces, and start to work with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to bring this to a close before I invite Shiba and uh, Asifa. But um, so some of the takeaways and what we have been able to discuss so far is, um, you know, just being able to, um, and I'll start from what Dahlia you have just mentioned, that this kind of of conversation or COP, next month's COP uh, meeting needs to be realistic and be able to bring, um, you know, global cooperation um, and also just being able to involve key stakeholders. And we have seen why it's and how important children are in driving these conversations. 
So we need to bring them at just not to listen to them, but for them to be at the core in terms of, and they're very integral in terms of the implementation of the commitment. So they need not just to be brought at the high level meeting and make presentation, but they need to be involved in the realization of these commitments. We have also talked about you know, how do we become more realistic? So not just coming up with beautiful commitments and beautiful documents, but how do we make this more realistic and holistic? And, and, and like what Iman said, that we need to focus on small problems that actually balloons up, you know, because we start from small problems. The problems you see today, at one point they are very small, and today we are trying to deal with this, you know, this big problem. While if we had dealt with it at that stage where it was, you know, very little and not not very harmful, then we couldn't be here today. So these are some of my key takeaways, and we have two more two more discussions, and we want to invite you to to be part of this on 30, 30th, I, I think 30, 30th of this month, we have the second dialogue series and then on 15th. And we want to compile this. We'll be able to be having um, media interviews. Um, we'll, we'll talk, we take this to COP27. We'll talk, talk about this to, you know, in our country, um, have media conference, online media conference. Uh, Basit talked about the essence of having this kind of dialogue, you know, we are coming from different countries, but we have been able to deliberate on a number of things, not physical meetings. So we are, we'll be able to come up with an, an e uh, press conference and being able to invite a, a number of journalists to talk about some of the recommendations from this meeting. So I'll invite Hiba and then Asifa will close uh, this forum. Thank you so much. It was wonderful hearing from you. We'll share with you a summary report from this meeting, and then we'll continue engaging. Thank you so much. Over to you, Hiba. Uh, um, all right, everyone. I think uh, Salim summarized everything uh, nicely. I think we are already on time front, so I would like thank you all uh, for joining us. There were a little this. Uh, disruptions and all the session because it was our first session so we next session will be more organized probably and we will be well aware of our devices and everything and our connections as well um so over to you aspa uh, let's close this formally thank you so much everyone for joining in asifa you need to unmute So oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Yes, uh, basically, um, first of all, thank you, Hiba. And uh, I measure the success of COP27 of powerful nations to intervene uh, the countries who are major carbon emission like Europe or China. So um, for me, uh, this will be successful if we'll send some kind of notification and the other countries will try them to cut down the carbon emission so that will be successful well uh, for the today's session um, on the behalf of my team i am very thankful to all of you to be the part of this webinar and i hope uh, uh, i will see you all again in the next session as well i request you all to motivate others to join but try to pay back our planet earth and as being an active climate action activist and also um, appreciate all my guests speakers who gave their valuable time and shared issues with solution um, basically i enjoyed the time we spent here for the cause and there were some kind of uh, destruction probably this will be sorted out in next session so thank you so very much and i'm really thankful to those participants who are silent members and who raise their voice in question answer and they also send some written message in the chat box um, thank you so very much everyone over to you Salim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so you can follow, you can have this. Um, we'll send you the link to YouTube. You are live on YouTube. So you can share this discussion in your social media. Um, and we'll invite you to the next session. We'll have more structured conversation individually with you as we try to have 
a more um, you know a good discussion next time. So thank you so much, thank you, Sharif. Um, and it was a short notice, but we really appreciate your input. Thank you, Iman. You are doing an amazing work. Continue doing this um, and inspiring um, other children and the world. Thank you, Basit, for the wonderful job. We have learned so much from you, Dalia. Like always, we appreciate what you are doing, Sajida. We celebrate you for the work that you are doing, and to our wonderful participant and everybody who has participated we say thank you and enjoy the rest of your day have a good night have a good afternoon thank you so much thank you so much all of you thanks for organizing this bye 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 thank you bye, thank you. bye thank you thank you so much goodbye thank you Basit. bye Bye, my people. <laughs> What's happening with you? Asifa, what happened to you? It's just Asifa, regular it... third world country and it's internet connection. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Different. Asifa, you, Asifa, you are both in waiting room. Asifa, are you there? Yes, I'm here back. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> We did Wonderful it. We did it. Has left. Okay. Amazing. Everyone Thank you so much. <laughs> Guys, do you see this this blazer? Then you Say see again. this. You see, you know, I have a blazer on with my peaches. Uh-huh. Who's the cool girl here? Okay. It was a nice session. I'm really proud of you all. We did it. I'm proud of you. I, I a, like the way you jumped in. No, 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 it's, it's well. You know that we are living in a new world, and I really yeah. appreciate I did know this will happen. You know, 15 yeah. people at one point we were around 18. So it was a good start for us. And I yeah. like the recommendations. Yeah, yes. So I, I think we'll start working on the on the report for this session and you know, just start throwing out there and stuff. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We are the team. Yes, Salim. Thank you. Okay, what, one thing, one thing. Um, so whose uh, Facebook has uh, most uh, likes or followers? Like which uh, your organization has good followers? How much is it? I think Salim? one point, uh, 1,500, I guess. Great. I think the recording of this session, you can premiere it on your Facebook and we will share it from that. Okay. Right. And by the way, on my fan page, there are more than 10,000 people. Then you you are doing it. So whoever has the most likes or followers, that person should uh, share it and all of us will reshare it from that place. 